Okay, everybody, before we start this video, I already filmed it, but from the video I did just before this where we repaired this and worked on it, I got so many comments um, that so many of you were disappointed that I didn't go through all of the controls and all of the features of the amplifier. I did that on purpose, believe it or not, because I do that so often that I figured maybe you know, you all know the ropes with that and kind of know what everything is. And uh, you know, I made an assumption that I shouldn't have made. So I apologize for that. And therefore, we're going to do a quick tour of this amplifier, what the knobs are and what they do. And uh, I think it'll dovetail very well with some of the tests that we do in this video, because as you'll see moving forward, some of these controls actually had a big influence over the results of our tests. So I, I won't spoil it, but uh, I'll just tell you that up front. Now, in case you haven't watched the last video, this is a Rotel model RA1412. And I suggest you go back and, and watch the video. Uh, I post a copy of all the spec sheets for this amplifier and everything on that video that you can look at it, as well as the RA1412. 1312 that I had many many years ago and it's the one that inspired me to want to get one of these and uh, and restore it so I won't get into those details but let's start at the left side of the panel here this is a pretty cool feature this unit has two headphone jacks so you and uh, and another can both listen to the headphones together with two separate sets of headphones you got your power switch up here one thing I'll tell you about this amplifier, it does not have a soft start circuit. And I mentioned that in the video, the previous video. And one of you mentioned that one of the newer models uh, of these, uh, not this, not a 1412, but one of the other models, actually, in the, it was a little higher powered unit than this one. It actually incorporated a soft start circuit. For those of you who don't know what a soft start circuit is, very quickly, Whenever you turn a power switch on, on a big amplifier, they have very big capacitors in them. Let's see if I have one here I can show you. So, for instance, here is a capacitor out of an amplifier. And you can see how big it is compared to my hand. And this is actually a medium-sized one. Some of the bigger amps uh, will even have larger caps than this. Uh, as this one does, it has four big 22,000 mic 22, microfarad capacitors. So that's 88,000 microfarads of, of capacitance. And when you push this button in, all that inrush current, that capa those capacitors want to charge immediately, as fast as they can. And the only limiting factor that limits the amount of current going into those caps is the internal resistance of the capacitor itself and the resistance of all the wiring and things connected to your coming from your mains and through your transformer and so forth. So you get this incredible inrush of current and when you push this power switch in you can imagine what those poor little contacts go through when they close and that massive current starts flowing. So power switches wear out, uh, very can wear out from that um, if you don't have something to limit that. So what a lot of amplifier manufacturers will do is they'll put a very big high wattage low resistance resistor in series with your power switch so that when you turn the power on the current is limited by that big power resistor. It, it absorbs a big portion of that current it does take those capacitors longer to charge up, so there's a little delay uh, before the, the protect circuit will drop out, and it's, that's done on purpose, but it prevents your power switch and so forth uh, from wearing out prematurely. In addition, when you get the enormous power amplifiers, the ones that are hundreds of watts per channel, they can actually have so much inrush current that it could actually take the, the mains breaker out in your mains when you hit the power switch if you didn't have those limiting resistors in there. 
after a period of time then, and it's just literally a split second, once the biggest part of the inrush current is over with and the current starts to drop, a relay will come in and it will short out that current limiting resistor to allow the full energy from your mains to get through uh, the power switch and out to the amplifier. So that's called a soft start circuit because it lets it lets those caps come up in, in a soft way instead of a real hard bam, you know, high high current. So this does not have that. So <laughs> I always wonder how long this power switch is going to last. And you might say, well, why don't you put a soft start circuit in? Uh, you could. Uh, quite frankly, you could. I've also had the comment many, many times, and I'm going on and on here, but why don't you use a thermistor? A thermistor is a device that starts out at a high resistance, okay, at least with an NTC one, and when you put, when you start drawing current through it, it heats up and the heat causes the resistance to drop and then it drops to a low resistance. Well, two things about those that I don't like. Number one, they have to, they have to heat up in order to work, so they produce a lot of heat. And I don't want all that extra heat inside my amplifier. And second of all, even though they go to low resistance, they still leave a resistance in the mains line of the amplifier, which theoretically could cause some current limit uh, to the amplifier, uh, which could affect your dynamic power and so forth. So I don't like those, um, although there are amplifiers that have used them, uh, incorporated them into the design. I like the soft start circuit with the resistor and the relay much better. Anyway, you have three speakers, sets of speaker terminals on this. And yes, you can turn all three on at the same time, but you, I would caution you to beware of the impedance of your speakers because this amplifier probably does not like anything lower than four ohms. And if you try to put anything, you know, whenever you put speakers in parallel, of course, the, the impedance of that speaker load will drop lower and lower resistance and that can cause a problem uh, by overloading the outputs of the amplifier and it, the best case scenario it'll cause it to go into protect uh, at higher power and worst case scenario it could damage components in the amplifier. So it's nice to be able to switch between different speakers but you certainly don't want them all running in parallel at the same time. Okay, moving over here, we have our tone control section and our mode selection. And at the top, we have our meters, our power meters. And if you notice, it shows you the watts at 8 ohms. In other words, these meters are only accurate if you have an 8 ohm load attached to them. If you have 4 ohms, the wattage is going to be different, okay? And I do other videos on that that you could go refer to. Uh, I think I did one called Watts, all this about Watts. <laughs> so uh, you might want to look that one up. Uh, bass and treble, we all know what those are. But what are these turnover switches? What do they mean? Well, if we put the switches in the middle like this, the tone controls are bypassed. In other words, the signal comes from the volume knob and it goes straight through bypassing this through these switches and out to the power amp section. So there's no influence of the circuitry in the tone control section. All right, that's what that does. If I turn these knobs up or down, or these switches, I'm sorry, you actually have two center points uh, of control that you can select from for the bass and for the treble. So if we set it to the 200 hertz, the center point of this control is going to mostly affect 200 hertz uh, frequency range and then like above and below that it'll taper off the influence that this knob will have. This would be 400 hertz, meaning it's a higher bass frequency that it will have the most influence over. So essentially, it's like having two different bass controls in one, and you can select from one or the other. Same thing with treble, it's the same deal. You can have it set to 5 kilohertz, which is a relatively high frequency, where it'll have the most influence, 
or half of that, which is 2.5. So that's what that's all about. Filters. Why do we want filters? Well, you have a low cut filter and a high cut filter. And the purpose for those on systems like this, this was a very common thing. And sometimes they would call them a rumble filter, the low cut filter. And you have two different frequencies where it will actually attenuate all the frequencies below this one. So at 30 hertz, it's flat. But any frequency below 30 hertz that tries to pass through this tone control section, it will roll them off at a certain rate, you know, either 6 dB per octave or whatever. And the idea of that, especially with this 15 hertz, is if you're playing a record, you know, vinyl, through a turntable, turntables, especially some of the lower end ones or ones that are not on a, on a properly damped base, they can actually exhibit a very low frequency rumble and that comes from all of the different mechanics moving around in the turntable, the mechanics of the cartridge itself, uh, the tone arm, uh, outside external vibrations, uh, the, the speakers vibrating the floor feeding back into the turntable mechanically. All of those things can cause what's called a low frequency rumble and what it sounds like is you'll just hear this low, you'll feel this low kind of rumbly pressure in the room <laughs> from the speakers and if you pull the grill cloth off your speakers you'll actually see them fluttering even though there's no sound, there's no music being played. And what these what this low cut does is it removes that, it attenuates that, so you have less of that. The trade-off is the amplifier does not have as deep of a bass sound to it. So if you're listening to a CD player or a cassette, uh, you would want to have this out. This is only comes in play if you're having rumble problems with your turntable or something, something to that effect. Okay. Same thing with the high cut filter. Uh, if you're if you have an excessive amount of hiss or high frequency noise or uh, the, the, it sounds tinny or whatever, you can turn on the high cut filter and it will attenuate frequencies above those, you know, either 12 kilohertz or 8 kilohertz. And it'll make the sound more muffled if you listen to it, but in some recordings or with some kind, some types of uh, audio media that you're playing into here, you may need to do that. I've very rarely, if ever, have used that. In Back in the day, I would have to turn this one on once in a while on an amplifier if I'm using a turntable, because I never really had super high, you know, expensive high-end turntables, nor did I ever have a really good uh, base to set them on just you know you're a kid and you have a turntable and it sits up on your counter or whatever <laughs> in your bedroom and uh, yeah you, you get rumble <laughs> it happens it just it was a fact of life and that's why that was there the mode okay normally you would leave this in stereo mode and all that means is that when whatever you plug into the right channel input you know auxiliary or phono or tuner or whatever it comes out of the right channel, you know, anything going in the left channel of the input comes out of the left channel of the speaker jack. And anything in the right channel goes to the right channel and they're separated from one of them. It's just two independent amplifiers working as left and right channel. If I turn this into reverse, it'll swap them around. It'll swap the left and right. You can have both channels tied together and what that does is if I set this to left or right, all whatever you put in the input of the left channel, you will get out of both channels of the output. So I only have to plug into the left channel uh, auxiliary in or tuner in or whatever to get both channels to play out in mono, you know, left and right out of the speaker terminals. Same thing with right channel. Left plus right means that you essentially don't want the channels to be playing in stereo. So if you want the amplifier to play in mono, it's going to take the left channel and the right channel inputs, mix them together, kind of like a mixer, and then 
split them and output them to right and left speaker channel. Okay, that's what this does. Sometimes I'll use the left and right. This is a good thing if you have, for instance, on your stereo, and I don't know if I've been off camera this whole time or not, but if you have one of these connect, like I have an amplifier, it's a Pioneer, but that's what I use to listen to my speakers on my desk, on my computer. And a lot of times if I'm watching a video of somebody, I hate video cameras because they have stereo microphones in them, and if you're standing to the right or to the left of the camera, it always makes the audio go to that channel. And most cameras do not have the capacity to select mono. <laughs> I don't know why. Like my big expensive, uh, my nice Sony right here. Uh, what is this? A model. What is that? FDR AX33. This is what I did all my videos on prior to this Panasonic that I'm using. It can do it can do surround sound, five five channel surround sound, Dolby Pro Logic. It has these microphones all around it. But the, you can only do stereo. You can't do mono. And if you stand on one side or the other of the camera, it invariably gives you, you know, more volume in one channel than the other. A lot of people record their videos like that. And when you play it back in your headphones, it'll drive you batty because somebody's talking and it's louder in one ear than in the other. If you turn this to left plus right, it flattens that right out. It's perfect. So I really like that for that. And I do use that sometimes. Moving right along, here is your, let's see, your loudness control. And this is going to this is actually going to be featured in this video, all right? And what this does is our ears, our human ears, cannot hear certain frequencies the same at low volumes as they do at high volumes. That's why a lot of people tend to listen to their music really loud. Um, if you don't have a really efficient speaker system and you don't have a good listening environment uh, and where your ears aren't perfect, what will happen is when you're listening to the to your music at low volumes it doesn't sound balanced and really until you get the volume cranked up you can't hear all the frequencies clearly and, ba and in a balanced manner so that's why a lot of people will crank the volume louder than it really needs to be and you hurt your ears but this was designed to work around that a little bit so if you turn the loudness on and there's two levels of it, so this is a good feature. Most of them just have one, you know, on and off. This one actually has two amounts of loudness boost that you can do. And what it does is at low frequencies, at low volumes, low frequencies, it will boost the low frequencies, okay? And as you turn this volume knob up, the influence of this switch becomes less and less. So there's the most influence down here and the least influence up here. And if you ever noticed a potentiometer that has four pins on it, that fourth pin is called your loudness tap. And the purpose it, it is, is it's tapped off right about here in the circuit or in the pot itself. And it goes down to this switch and to the little circuit, the little filter network that goes with this switch. And the whole purpose of that is as you're turning, you have the wiper of the pot going around there. Once it passes that tap, it begins to have less and less influence and it becomes more of a flat amplifier once again. So that's what this does. We're going to look at this. All right. Muting. Well, this is a good feature because volume knobs, even though they have a logarithmic taper to them, meaning it has less influence in the first half and then gets greater influence, you know, more rapidly changes as you go up, it's supposed to mimic the function of your ear, of how your ear responds to sound pressure. Even with that, you don't have enough space always to get the volume just how you want it. And if you notice, this is a detented volume knob. So I can go from here to here to here, but I can't go here. <laughs> and sometimes this is not loud enough and this is too loud 
And what do you do? That's why I don't like detented volume knobs for that reason in some ways. It's a, that's one disadvantage. What this does is this reduces the overall volume to this pot by either 10 or 20 decibels. And in order to, and because we're doing that, you have greater control. More of these clicks make less of a difference. So you have, at low volumes, you have more control over how loud you want it to be. So that's what these two are for. If you have these muting switches, a detented volume knob is the way to go because, especially if it's a stepped attenuator instead of a, an actual potentiometer, because they're very well balanced and they track very well between left and right channels. So that's what this is for. You ever get that point where one click is too much and the other click is not enough? You use your muting and you'll find that you'll be able to get the volume you want. Now, of course, this is something that people probably don't deal with very much anymore. When you had tape decks, uh, you could connect up to two tape decks to this thing. And if you put it on source, it means that the amplifier is going to listen to whatever you have selected up here. But if you want to listen to one of your tape decks, tape deck number one and tape deck number two are these two positions, okay? And if you want to monitor recording from one deck to another, that's what these outer ones are, all right? And that's a separate switch from your inputs here because one thing that you do with tape decks is you can, while you're recording something like so, if I wanted to record a phonograph or a record, okay, and I want to hear what it sounds like as it's being recorded, this creates like a loop that I can monitor. If, if I'm recording my phonograph to cassette deck number one and I go to here, I can actually listen to what the tape is going to sound like after it's recorded. So the tape, the phonograph output <laughs> goes into the tape deck, goes through the record head, and is picked up by the play head, and comes back into here and plays into the amplifier. Does that make sense? Now, some tape decks have the ability to monitor the sound on their own without this, uh, but a lot of them don't. So this gives you that feature, it's pretty cool. All right, you guys like karaoke? Well, before karaoke was a thing, these amplifiers had mic mixing. So you could actually plug just a low end uh, microphone into here, an unbalanced mic. And if you pull this knob out, it clicks and you can see mic mixing lights up. And this, gives you how much influence of the microphone you want to have over top of mixed in with whatever you're listening to here. So there you go. You can even back then you could do karaoke if you wanted to. And then these are self-explanatory. These are the inputs. So you could have two turntables, a tuner, two auxiliaries, and two tape decks. So there's a lot of inputs on this amplifier. Okay, located on the right side of the amplifier is your input section. So this amp is different than a lot of others. Many amplifiers, the inputs and speaker outputs are on the rear of the amplifier. On this one, it's on the two sides, the right and the left. On the right side of this amplifier is your input panel. And you can see all of the different inputs. So you have your phonograph inputs, and this one even has a DIN input for your phonograph. It has a second phonograph input with these little shorting jumpers. And I don't actually think these are shorting. I think these are just covers to cover the two. And what all this is doing is these are shields preventing noise from getting into the preamp. Phono inputs are very, very high gain. So if I have a turntable attached here, even though I don't have one selected here, these can be a source of noise because they're, they're not ground, grounded through the cartridge of the turntable. So these little covers shield that somewhat. Uh, so 
you don't get if you only have one turntable you don't get any noise through there in addition to that both phono 1 and phono 2 I don't know if you can see it have uh, input impedance selects so if you have an exotic cartridge that is doesn't have the standard 50k impedance you have different impedances you can set and even if you do have a 50k cartridge you can change this impedance match and it will change the performance of the cartridge how it sounds and maybe to your ears you may like it you know with a different setting all right I, you know I'm sure that some uh, turntable aficionados are losing their mind that I'm saying this right now but you know what it's what you like what it sounds good to you not not what science tells you or whatever I mean I've heard things that were set up that are completely wrong, but the person likes it, you know. I had an uncle that loved listening to his stereo. He had very good gear, but he liked the, the bass turned all the way off. He liked mid-range and high frequencies much better, and he didn't like loud, boomy bass. It's the way he liked it. I didn't like the sound. He loved it that way, and that was all that mattered, you know. You listen to it the way you like it. All right, tuner input, two auxiliaries, and you can see our signal generators connected there. Tape monitor, so these are your two tape decks, the record and play. All right, record, play for both. And you can even use the reel-to-reel -reel decks and so forth and some of the cassette decks that had the DIN plugs on them. So that's a, that's a big bonus for this thing. And then last but not least is the preamp out and main amp in and the switch okay switching this to unite just connects these two plugs together and connects these two plugs together switching it to separate or separate takes them apart so now I can connect this to another external power amp or I can get another preamp and connect it into here because these are now separate. You, now you have two separate components inside this box, a preamp and a power amp. When I switch them together, it becomes an integrated amplifier. Does that make sense? All right. On the back of the amplifier, without taking the thing off of the <laughs> off of the, the stand, the camera mount, you just have an entire gigantic heat sink. There's two heat sink modules, one here and one here. There's four transistors per channel, and there are those TO3 transistors, those big oval shaped ones. There's two here, two here, two here, and two here. And the whole back of the amplifier is heat sink. So very, very good heat management on this amplifier. Last but not least is your speaker terminals, and this amplifier has the best speaker terminals I've seen in a long time. These are all metal, and they're very sturdy. They're not those cheap plastic ones that'll strip out. Uh, this is a slotted screw, so I can unthread this all the way back, way back here, and I can take a really thick speaker wire and kind of pinch it flat and shove it in there, and uh, it'll be really secure. Since these are hex nuts, you can actually use a nut driver to tighten them. Of course, you don't want to tighten it so hard that it breaks it. But these are very good quality speaker terminals. And you can see channel one, or I mean speaker set one, speaker set two, and speaker set three. And right here is the infamous terminals that I re reversed on that last video. <laughs> So there you go, that's the tour of the amplifier. That's what it is, that's what the controls are. That's how they work. And let's get on with the video.